Bomani Jones back here on the show. How you doing, sir? I'm good, bad. How about you? I'm better than what the Sixers must be going through. How's that for a transition to start us off? <laughs> I have a tendency to antagonize the Sixers loyalists because they had to convince themselves that being abjectly terrible for a long time was for the greater good. You know, so they, they're they're all in on their team in a much different way because I feel like people want a certain measure of vindication for buying into that travesty that they got into. And now here where they are, right? Embiid's got this knee problem that, like, I don't think that we're just talking about something that's going to be a thing right now. He's playing on a torn meniscus. Like, that's not a good long-term thing to do. The other superstar talent that they have is Ben Simmons, and he seems terrified of the idea of shooting in an NBA game, which is kind of a weird thing to say about an NBA player. They gave $30 million to to Tobias Harris, and he's just being Tobias Harris. Like, he should have played better than he did yesterday, but, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is you think he's supposed to get out of Tobias Harris. And they really talked themselves into, like, thinking that this was a team that was going to win the championship. But who knows? It may be a disaster right now. They ultimately turn into champions. But they look like bums last night. That is uh, a soliloquy that I cannot argue a single syllable is off at all, Bomani. And the way that you started it is a perfect way. Is that what, what did you say? That being abjectly terrible for a long time was for the greater good. That the trust, the process doesn't wind up with this being the end result that requires Daryl Morey to come in, um, you know, and and change things around from what Sam Hinkie, his friend, started. Like, that may actually be the bright, shining object in the room for the for Sixers to have to deal with right now. Yeah, so, like, yeah, so for me, with, like, the, the Hinkie thing, his tenure was abbreviated, and, like, you can't it, – it's easy to lump it all together and then say, like, he's responsible for Mark Dale Fultz. And I don't even know who's responsible for that, to be perfectly honest. But that's not on him. He didn't draft Ben Simmons, but he would have drafted Ben Simmons because we all would have drafted right. Ben Simmons under the same circumstance. Correct. But the idea was we can get – you know, the best way to do this is to do this in order to get the caliber of top-line talent that is needed to win in the NBA – and they got it, except Embiid, when they got him, was an open box special because he was hurt and has been fairly consistently hurt um, for much of his career. And then Simmons has all the talent, but there seems to be a sort of block that stops him from becoming the player that they need him to be in order for this team-building strategy that they've used to work. So what happens? I mean, you can't dispute also your analysis, Bomani Jones, that – Simmons looks like he's afraid to shoot in an NBA game, which is strange to say about an NBA player. Oh, for one in the second half of a game where, you know, they were killing it in the third quarter and then couldn't get anything done properly in the fourth quarter. Uh, that is the ultimate. And then also being a liability on the court to allow the Hawks to get the possessions they needed to get back in the game because he can't make a free throw. I mean, that's wild. <laughs> The free throw thing is weird because he's not the first person that we've seen teams intentionally put on the line, right? right? Like we saw it from Shaq, obviously. We've seen it from you know Dwight Howard. DeAndre the got it. Yeah, right. And then DeAndre Jordan, who's not the same caliber player of these guys that we're talking about, but he wound up on the business end of the same strategy. The thing that's interesting about all those guys, though, that's different from Simmons is they went up there and they were in their heads, obviously, when they were shooting the free throws at times. But it didn't seem to affect everything else. And so with Simmons, the free throw thing seems to spill over, and then he doesn't want to do anything, and then he's terrified of getting the ball because then they're going to put him on the line. But the truth is, if you go and you hit one out of two free throws every time they do that, that's actually a win. Like, if you can get one point per possession on that, the teams aren't going to keep this up. But if you shoot four for 14, then I don't know why they tried anything else. I would have been trying to sign a free agent in the middle of the game just to get six fouls. Amani <laughs> Jones here on the Rich Eisen Show. Conversely, though, uh, the performance by Paul George, uh, I don't even know what's the, if the word unexpected is proper to describe it. What word do you use to describe it? Bumani? Oh, no, I'll go with unexpected. Okay. I, I did not see that coming. And something that I think is interesting to think about with Paul George, he was a number one option in Indiana. And look, they went game seven with those heat. Like they had a legitimate chance to go to a NBA finals. I don't think they were champions, but he was the best player on a team that was right there on the doorstep. 
when he got to Oklahoma City, what was interesting was that a guy like that was so willing to play with a dominant figure like Russell Westbrook and actually had his best season playing as a number two. But when they got to the playoffs, he wasn't a dude that you could count on. And it seems weird that you you might be able to better count on him as the number one than the number two. Like almost if he's the number two, he's like, okay, this other guy's got it. You know, you don't really need too much for me. But they needed everything that he gave them, right? Because that roster, it really stands out without Kawhi. When you look at Paul George and then see who else is out there, like that's not a team that should win a game in the second round of the playoffs, except he carried them. And I've had all the jokes about him and the playoff P and everything else. He earned all the praise from the way he performed in that game. Which one do you expect to win a game six more, the Bucks at home against the Nets or, or the Clippers to close it out against the Jazz? Which one would you choose if you had to choose only one? I am silly enough to believe that the Bucks are still going to win that series. And Kevin Durant put in such a superhuman performance in that game. And James Harden basically was there. Like, they were playing 405, four on five with him on the floor. And that was why Budenholzer, it was such an indictment of him that nobody went out of their way to attack James Harden and that hamstring. When Chris Paul went on that run in game four against the Nuggets, it was because they were relentlessly attacking Michael Porter Jr. Like, they had made the call, this dude can't guard anybody. We're going to go at him, at him, at him. And they didn't do that in Milwaukee. And so I still think that everything is there for them to win that series just because outside of Kevin Durant, the Nets don't have anything. But they got to go inside and they got to play like their big people are big people. Because if you really think about this series, the most underrated thing that Milwaukee has is they're, the the Nets literally have no one capable of guarding Brook Lopez if they just set him up on the block every possession and gave him the ball. And they'll never do that. And I don't understand why he's 27 feet from the basket when nobody could guard him. He's right next to it. That is a good point. That is a good point. And, and then, you know, we had Kendrick Perkins on the show yesterday. He says, watch the Nets bench uh, every time um, Giannis makes a jump shot, they're clapping because he's not going to the rim. And, yeah. you know, and so – Maybe just maybe they do get this thing straight on the straight and narrow, and they force a game seven. I I don't, and then and then we'll see obviously who who whoever wins that series who they play next. And I kind of feel for the Hawks because you know we're we're a Northeast and an East Coast biased uh, media, and even though we're sitting out here in Los Angeles, Bamani Jones, but uh, <laughs> the Sixers you know disintegrating is the story that everyone's talking about, and Trey Young is doing what he's doing along with the Nate McMillan coached Hawks. Can you put in perspective uh, from your from your point of view what Trey Young is doing right now? Okay, so I want to preface this by saying that I grew up rooting for the Atlanta Hawks, and then that ceased on February 24th, 1994, when somebody got the bright idea that trading the greatest player in the history of your franchise for a couple of months of Danny Manning was a good idea. <laughs> I left and I never came back. And you know what? Haven't missed him once. Have not at all, because what have the Hawks ever done to provide happiness for their fan base? I don't recall seeing it at any point in my life until (laughs) now. Like, this is a fun team. This is a team that has weapons, and Trey Young, even though I hate what I call his whole insurance fraud uh, strategy of playing offense where he's just jumping in front of you and then slamming on the brakes so you can run into him and he can get a settlement. Like, you go to his house, you look in the closet, there's a bunch of neck braces for every time that he has pulled this little scam off. But... (sighs) He is so – like the best thing about him, and Ben Simmons being in this series allows you to see what this contrast is. If you were to ask me which of those two guys I thought was a better player, I would tell you that Ben Simmons is a better player just because he's such an elite defender and Trey Young is one of the worst defenders in the league. However, you get to this place where we are in the postseason, and if you were on a 6-0 run, Trey Young can decide that it's not going to be an 8-0 run. Like, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to get a bucket. You need a guy in the postseason who is capable of doing that, and he is that dude. And so for the Hawks, you could go to some advanced numbers and probably even find some guys on that roster that might even qualify as being better players than Trey Young. But nothing at this time is more important than a guy when everybody else is getting tight that can just say, all right, boys, I got this. And everybody look at him and say, you know what, he probably does. And that's what he's been for them this entire postseason. He sure has been. And I was uh, I was uh, preparing my audience at the top of the show, Bomani Jones, that if Trey Young advances, get ready for the take that the the Hawks were were right to trade Luca for him. <laughs> I'm getting everyone prepared for that hot take. 
Bomani oh, Bomani. Man. See, it's so funny that people keep like relitigating that trade, and I feel like in Sacramento they got to be like, yeah, just don't talk about us. <laughs> like DeAndre Ayton, that seems to be working out. Trey Young, that seems to be working out. Right? Like all you could hope for is I would like for this thing to work out, mm-hmm. and it's worked out for these guys. Meanwhile, Marvin Bagley's up there in Sacramento, and ain't nothing working out there. I don't even know if he's working out. Like literally, I have no idea if he's lifting weights. <laughs> Bomani Jones here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. How do you uh, crystal ball it with Aaron Rodgers? How do you think that's going to work out? Uh, I just don't think he ain't going to play for them again. Like, mm. he, he seems so resolute on, I don't want to play for you guys anymore. And so the Packers are going to have to make the decision about if they're willing to trade him and where they're willing to trade him. And I'll be honest, if I was the Packers, it's not like there's going to be another draft before the season starts, right? Like, it's not like somebody's going to be able to give you some capital that you can really use this season. If he says he wants to sit at the house, I would let him sit at the house. But they need to understand they blew this. They, they somehow did not know Aaron Rodgers as well as us strangers know Aaron Rodgers. And the second that you made that pick, you made the move to the future. And so he made his move to the future, and then he messed around and had his best year that he had in who knows how long, and now they want to keep him around. And he's like, nah, man, I'm good. And I bet he's willing to do the Carson Palmer and go to the house. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know how, where, where, he, where he winds up this year then. I don't see Green Bay trading him. It doesn't make sense to trade him now for assets that he's only going to improve um for for the team that that acquires him you know that's a great point and and, and <laughs> trade him away at that first round pick becomes the 28 well that's what I, I that's what I'm saying is that you know waiting for next year when when the team that wants to acquire Rodgers is finished with their season of being terrible that's a better draft pick for Green Bay to acquire then and I also don't see a better spot for Aaron Rodgers to win now like the places that might acquire him are not Tampa Bay ready. You know what I mean? They're, they're, I, I don't, you know, obviously Rodgers is talented enough to do what Brady did last year, which is to go to a new team and make it his own fast. And But it, there still wouldn't even be an offseason to do that, you know? I, I, I don't know what palatable options there are for Rodgers to win a Super Bowl this year other than the, the one of going back to Green Bay and then figuring out where he goes from there. I don't, I just don't know, Bomani, you know? Yeah. I, I agree. I don't, I don't see any easy there, – there's no team like, – like you say, there's no team like Tampa Bay was that is an Aaron Rodgers away from being a Super Bowl contender that I can think of that doesn't already have a quarterback. Like I, I, I just can't think of who the team is that's going to be that. I am just fascinated by the idea that he is so sick of them and coincidentally so rich that if he wants to, he can just say, I'm not going to play for you guys, right. period, right. and just not show up. And I wish I was that free. Like when Magic Johnson showed up that day and quit his job and told us before he even told his boss, I was like, man, I wish I was that free. I would never <laughs> do anything like that. But I would love to have that kind of freedom and flexibility in my life. Just be like, nah, I, I just ain't doing this job no more. And uh, then move on. And Aaron Rodgers seems to be there and at that place. And – if that's how he feels, like there's nothing for us to say. If he's willing to give them back millions of dollars to never play for them, then bless his heart. And if I'm the Packers, he's going to have to show us that he's willing to give us back millions of dollars. And if he is, it might be embarrassing to us, but, I mean, at least he meant it. couple more uh, minutes left with Bomani Jones, the right time with Bomani Jones podcast, uh, the ESPN uh, host as well as analyst here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, 27 years ago is when uh, O.J. hopped in that uh, white Ford Bronco. I remember where I was. Where were you on that oh, day? I know exactly where I was. I'm from Houston. We were watching the game. That's right. And the next thing you do, it was all on the screen. And I am young enough that, like, I didn't fully understand the magnitude of O.J. Simpson. Like, he was the broadcaster to me, right. not, you know, the hero of an entire generation. And it was just the strangest thing in the world when the people were over there. It was like the quote-unquote chase itself. I didn't find that to be so bizarre. Is when the people started showing up at the overpass. And keep in mind, this isn't like the internet era. You know, we were operating on some analog technology to people to find out what was going on decide they wanted to get their little moment of fame. And they were out there. And, man, that year and a half did not do good things for America, let me tell you. Yeah, I, I remember it was um, Rockets Knicks. 
is what it was. Yep. It was uh, NBA Finals, Rockets, Knicks, right there in the middle of 27 years ago. And I remember, um, you know, they 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 had a split screen um, on on the game five of the NBA Finals, and on, on one screen was the was the Bronco, and then the other screen and the other square was um, was an actual big time NBA Finals basketball game with Hall of Famers playing in it. You know, and, future and Hall of Famers. Never forget this part. This is, I think, the easiest thing to forget about that. He worked at NBC. That's right. At the time. Can you imagine that like they're running the broadcast and your coworker <laughs> is, is evading a murder charge, it appears, while this is all going on? Like I, I would have loved to have seen the email chain at NBC. Like, what in the world are we about to do? Yeah, I was at I was at my post Medill School of Journalism graduate uh graduation dinner with friends in a Chicago bar. And just for you know what's and giggles, when the whole place was just standing around the television set and just like their jaws down on the ground watching the square with the white Ford Bronco. I was the Nick fan screaming. It was a flagrant foul (laughs) and the stares I got from people like, what the hell is your problem? Um, (laughs) But it was fun. You know, that was just my way of just kind of breaking the tension because man, it was tense. That is for sure. You know, that was wild back in that day, 27 years ago. Bomani, I always appreciate our conversations. Um, let's, uh, I, I look for my call as we go through these NBA finals and throughout the summer and, and beyond. I really appreciate it. No problem, man. You guys have a good one. I really enjoy uh, everything uh, that Bomani Jones brings to the table whenever we have a conversation. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here. 